Hey everybody, welcome and thanks for joining me this evening. My name is David Volette and I am an Associate Professor of Art History and the Co-Chair of the Art Program at College of DuPage. And tonight I'll be presenting a lecture entitled Frida Kahlo and the Animal Self. But before I get started, I'd like to humbly acknowledge that as the descendant of settlers, I live, work, and study as a guest on the unceded and occupied ancestral homelands of the Kickapoo, Peoria, Potawatomi, Miami, Ocheti Sakowin, Fox, and Sauk people who were subjected to the harmful policies of forced removal, eradication, and re-education by the United States government and its colonial enterprises. This land acknowledgement is really just a simple gesture of respect, honor, gratitude to the past, present, and future Native peoples who continue to steward this land and its waters. I hope it encourages others to stand in solidarity with Native peoples in this country and around the world in their struggle for reconciliation, sovereignty, and land restoration. It's important to acknowledge Native people and Native land when viewing work by artists like Frida who were compelled to include their own Indigenous heritage in their work. As I mentioned, my lecture this evening is entitled Frida Kahlo and the Animal Self. In Frida Kahlo's 1945 self-portrait with Changuito, the artist stares out at the viewer as the central figure in a grouping that includes a spider monkey, a hairless dog, and a pre-Columbian sculpture. One of her most accomplished self-portraits, Frida's braided hair, woven shawl, and trademark features are rendered in thin layers of oil paint on a masonite board. Among all of her self-portrait, this one stands out and signals distinct aspects of the artist's social, political, and species identity I'd like to explore in this talk. As we will see, complex interspecies dialogues are at play in self-portrait with Changuito, and like the golden ribbon that weaves its way through the surface of this picture, all are intimately linked with the artist. Non-human animals feature prominently in many of Frida's most celebrated works, especially those produced between 1937 and 1946. All told, 55 of her 143 paintings feature her animal companions, either as themselves or as interspecies models for allegorical purposes. This includes her parrot Bonito, two Mexican Itzcuintli dogs, uh, one of them named Senior Xolotl, uh, two spider monkeys called Fulang Chang and Caimito de Gayabal, a fawn named Graniso, and a scatologically named eagle, Gertrudis Cacablanca, whose white excrement starkly contrasted the brilliant blue walls of Casa Azul. One impetus for this lecture emerges from a cursory reading of Karl Marx's Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844, in which he describes his concepts of alienation and Gottensfacen, or species being, to which we will return later in this paper. Given Frieda's Marxist politics and revolutionary ideologies, Marx's perspectives seem particularly applicable here. But really, at no point is Marx directly concerned with the philosophical question of the animal. Rather, larger questions of what is it to be human and the impact of the capitalist structures of labor on human nature and the alienation of humans from nature and from their products of their labor, and of course from each other. However, one passage is particularly generative in the present discussion. Quote, as a result, therefore, the worker only feels himself freely active in his animal functions, eating, drinking, procreating, or at most in his dwelling and dressing up, etc. And in his human functions, he no longer feels himself to be anything but an animal. What is animal becomes human, and what is human becomes animal. In this talk, I want to reflect on the ways in which Frida's relationships with and depictions of her non-human companions present a kind of slippage into her overlapping indigenous, feminist, and species identities. The works in question are situated within a tradition of animal portraits, yet they're distinct for the ways in which the subjects are handled. The animals featured in historical portraits by da Vinci and Murillo, for example, are completely submissive and secondary within both the compositions and in the real-world attitudes um, at the time of their creation. 
In most cases, the animals stare blankly into the middle distance or look obediently to their masters. Neither indexically refer to the animals as autonomous beings, but instead present animals as symbolic and material references to concepts of wealth, status, and mastery. There are a few exceptions to this history, such as Hogarth's animals, who are foregrounded and given particular attention and individuality. While in historical animal portraits the non-human subjects are ancillary to the human protagonist, Hogarth's animals embody a sense of being and agency inspired by the artist's own relationship with his dog Trump, seen in 1945's The Painter and His Pug. Hogarth also produced a series of prints titled The Four Stages of Cruelty, denouncing the brutality towards animals that was so common to see on the streets of 18th century London. Hogarth's work reflects larger recognition of animal cruelty as a moral problem, but among his contemporaries like Locke, Bentham, and Kant, the concern is never violence towards animals in itself, but rather that this type of violence would likely escalate um, towards humans. In Locke's words, quote, the custom of tormenting and killing beasts will by degree harden their minds even towards men, end quote. And in Kant's words, Quote, for he who is cruel to animals becomes hard also in his dealings with men. And so here in these two plates, these are two of the four plates from Hogarth's series, the first stage of cruelty depicts a street scene in which various animals are being uh, tormented and tortured by young boys of London. And then um, one of the later plates, plate three, uh, known as Cruelty and Perfection, uh, culminates with the murder of a young woman by one of the boys featured in the previous uh, plates. Uh, in the history of animal painting, rarely does the animal gaze directly at the viewer and engage in the way that Frida's animals do. They share her characteristic defiant gaze, which scrutinizes the viewer across what John Berger calls a, quote, narrow abyss of non-comprehension, reflecting what Donna Haraway calls the, quote, significant otherness, end quote, of companion animals in which we are both significant and other, and significantly other. Writing specifically about human-canine relationships in her companion species manifesto, Haraway describes how our inseparable bonds with animal companions requires that we, quote, see who the dogs are and hear what they are telling us, not in bloodless abstraction, but in one-on-one -on -one relationship, in otherness, in connection, end quote. She rejects Levi Strauss's claim that animals are bona pensée or good to think, and argues that animals are not simply surrogates for theory, but rather fleshy material presences that must be taken seriously. Embedded deep within the history of human-animal relationships is the assumption that as humans, we construct a human world for human existence. But in reality, we co-make the world with animals and share in its consequence. We make the office building, but we also make the wildlife reserve, the pet store, and the factory farm. Whatever we make and share with animals affects us all. In Haraway's words, quote, dogs and people figure a universe, end quote. And from that co-poetic perspective, we might say that Frida had a dog just as much as Signor Scholot had a human. Frida's animal depictions explore a being withness, not previously centered within the humanities. So what I'd like to propose in this talk is not a hard and fast animal history of Frida's paintings, but instead reflections on three distinct ways in which the artist situated her identity within a more than human world. First, Indigenismo. I'd like to begin by establishing that Frida's companion animals were an extension of her Indigenismo. And in that way, the dogs, parrots, monkeys, and other companion species she filled her home and garden with are on some level symbolic, both in concept and corpus. They feature in her paintings not as beings in themselves, but as still life accessories to the artist's identity, which is likely vastly different from how she considered the animals in her life. As noted by Virginia Hernandez Reta, it's likely that Kahlo adopted each animal at least partly because of their symbolic significance in pre-Hispanic Mexican art and culture. The many species of flora and fauna represented a living material connection between the artist and her indigenismo. When arriving to Casa Azul in 1936, Natalia Sadova, 
the wife of Leon Trotsky, noted that she felt as if they had found themselves on a new planet surrounded by exotic and strange species of plants and animals. It's probably useful to establish a working definition for indigenismo, which is not only a reference to post-colonial mindset in artistic production, but also, and firstly, an emergent nationalist political identity in revolutionary Mexico and other Latin American countries in the early 20th century. Among its core tenets were the celebration of pre-Hispanic civilization, a vigorous rejection of the country's Spanish colonial history and heritage, and in the inclusion of indigenous peoples in state politics. Frida, forever alert to the artistic politics of the revolution and the celebration of indigenous people, considered pre-Columbian art to be the foundational source for all Mexican art. While Frida's use of pre-Columbian subjects paralleled the work of European surrealists who sought to invoke non-European traditions of image making as a sort of a rebuke to Western exceptionalism and rationalism, I want to make it clear that uh, the tradition of Western art history homogenizing Frida's work within those of the European surrealists, I think, um, really misrepresents the artist's intentions um, and beliefs. So in these two uh, images here, you can kind of see her drawing from that indigenous heritage, not only with her clothing, but in the Olmec uh, greenstone figure she holds here and the greenstone necklace she wears in the image on the left. Um, you know, parrots as symbolic of her uh, sort of indigeneity were central, and um, her parrots apparently had free reign at Casa Azul, uh, slept in her bed, and the one named Bonito both entertained and terrorized guests at the dinner table. And so here we see a uh, self-portrait with Bonito from 1941, a photograph with her and Bonito, and then a uh, a parrot sculpture, maybe a macaw sculpture, from the site of Xochicalco in Morelos uh, from around 800. So I think it might be useful um, just to think through some of the animal species that Frida chose to have in her home um, and sort of think about how those species held symbolic value in ancient Mexican um, societies. And I'm going to structure this discussion um, of the symbolism of these animals based around the Aztec calendar. And um, the Aztec calendar system was composed of 13 periods of 20 days each, and each of those 20 days uh, was named, many of them for animals, and was overseen by a patron deity. Uh, these records were maintained by timekeepers using uh, books like the one you see here with the Codex Borgia, um, not on gigantic stone cylinders uh, like we might have uh, seen elsewhere in ancient Mexican art. So um, day seven on the Aztec calendar is deer in Nahuatl. It's mazat. Uh, deer were mostly sources of meat and pelt and therefore were associated with hunting and springtime, but they also represented the fertility of springtime and in particular does represented the sort of femininity uh, of that fertility. They were mostly passive actors in mythology, and there are really no major myths that feature, uh, feature deers. However, uh, it's important to note that the place called Mazatlan, which today is still called Mazatlan, um, its symbol in antiquity was a net, and so the place of the deer uh, was symbolized by a hunting net, and so it shows you the connection between deers and hunting in the Mesoamerican mindset. Um, day eight, Tochtli was the rabbit. Rabbits were also animals of the hunt, uh, valued for their meat and for their uh, pelts, uh, but they're also associated with the underworld, which is their dwelling, right? They move freely between the two worlds, and in that sense, they're seen in some contexts as messengers. However, they're most commonly seen with references to the moon in ancient Mesoamerica. You know, where, whereas we see the image of a man in the moon, we've sort of anthropomorphized the moon, um, ancient Mesoamericans like Mayas and Aztecs and others saw the silhouette of a rabbit. Among Nahua speakers like the Aztecs, this reference to a myth from their creation story 
that described the punishment of a god named Tekiztekat, who was supposed to sacrifice himself and become the sun. Well, he didn't do that. He sort of chickened out at the last minute. And then when he finally did throw himself into a fire to um, sacrifice himself to become the sun, the other gods uh, threw a rabbit at him. And this rabbit hit him and dimmed his light. So he was dimmed into becoming the moon and not the sun. Day 10 on the Aztec calendar is Itzcuintli, is dog. The hairless breed kept by ancient uh, Mexicans is known as Xolot Itzquintli, uh, hence Frida's companion being named Senior Xolot. Uh, however, dogs in ancient Mexico weren't companions primarily, they were food, and they were bred over generations uh, to be hairless, much like our domestic pigs today. Along with turkeys, dogs were one of the only domesticated animals eaten by ancient Mesoamerican. Um, Spanish colonizers developed such an appetite for this convenient canine protein source that they nearly ate the Xolo Itzquintli into extinction. Um, dogs were also, also associated with the underworld in ancient Mexico, um, and Miklan Tecutli, who was the underworld lord, was the patron of the day dog of the day Itzquintli. Dogs accompanied the soul on its journey to the afterworld, Miklan, acting as protectors and guides. As Elizabeth Benson explains, dogs are appropriate escorts for the dead. Quote, they walk with their noses to the ground, they dig in the earth, bury bones, and hunt in burrows. They eat carrion and make themselves smell of it. They have night vision. They howl at night. They know what is there in the darkness. Relating to earth, to dead things, to sounds and smells that are imperceptible to human humans, Dogs have esoteric knowledge and special connections to the underworld, which is represented in the archaeological record by the presence of sculptures, small ceramic vessels like this one here from Colima, and the neighboring states of Nayarit and Jalisco. As many as 75% of the burials from the early periods of Mesoamerica, the pre-classic periods, contain canine vessels just like this one which served surely as symbolic guides uh, for the soul of the dead um, in the afterlife. Um, but also, as you can kind of see by their chunkiness, they were also uh, thought of as, as sustenance or as food in the afterlife. Day 11 on the calendar is monkey or ozomatli. And we all know how frequently monkeys appear in Frida's work. They actually appear more than any other animal. Um, Ozomatli was a fortuitous birthday, and those born on that day were fated to be artists, actors, dancers, or singers. The day was overseen by the god Xochipilli, who was the god of the arts, games, flowers, songs, and his spirit companion, or Nahua, his sort of spiritual alter ego, was a monkey. Um, the amicable spider monkey, like Frida's Chanquito was regarded as the most lively and playful creature in the animal kingdom, and based on their carefree disposition and uninhabited sexuality, symbolized hedonism in all of its forms. Monkeys were also associated with the wind. As Benson notes, quote, both wind and monkeys are restless and unpredictable, end quote. A monkey was one form of the Aztec wind god, Ejecat, depicted in this 15th century sculpture. According to the Leyenda de los Soles, or the Legend of the Five Suns, inhabitants of the world during the second sun, called Nahui Ejecat, uh, were turned into monkeys as the world was destroyed by a great windstorm, acknowledging their human-like status. Even the 16th century friar Bernardino de Sahagún noted that spider monkeys had, quote, a face which is a little too human. So monkeys are close to humans in ancient Mexican mindset. The 15th day on the Aztec calendar is Cuautli, or eagle. In Aztec thought, eagles symbolized all attributes of the sun and were connected to the solar deity, Tonatiu, in both his rising and setting manifestation. According to the myth, the golden eagle had a special role in the legendary founding of the Aztec capital, Tenochtitlan, which is depicted here on the Aztec uh, Mexican national flag. 
So Frida surrounded herself with non-human life in the form of plants and animals from her indigenous heritage. And in this way, she attempted to reconcile um, a pre-colonial or even we could even call it a post-colonial notion of being and connection uh, with nature right through her indigenismo. So we'll, we'll come back to that a bit later. Second, touch. It's well known that as a result of the ill-fated bus accident in September of 1925 that her, left her horribly injured, Frida was never able to bear a pregnancy to full term. Her animals, and in particular her monkeys, served as surrogate children to the Baron Kahlo. Emmy Lou Packard, the American painter and one of Diego's assistants, noted that Frida cared for her adopted animals as if they were her own children. Similarly, the four spider monkeys depicted in 1943's Self-Portrait with Monkeys likely refer to the students she taught and cared for at the Escuela Nacional de Pintura, Escultura and Grabado, known as La Esmeralda. Symbolically, Frida explored her own trauma and grief through painting her animals, who undoubtedly provided a great deal of therapy in return. One quintessential element of Frida's paintings with her animals is the emphasis on flesh-to-flesh -flesh interspecies contact and the expression of care through touch. The raw physicality of touch as a meeting place between two discrete bodies is perhaps the most animal sense that humans possess. In the absence of a shared language, body language and the primacy of touch facilitates interspecies communication. In Coetzee's The Lives of Animals, the protagonist Elizabeth Costello explains that instead of thinking and speaking like us, animals experience the world with their bodies, remarking that, quote, their whole being is in the living flesh, end quote. A comforting touch is among the most pleasant sensations we experience, while an aggressive or violent touch is the, the most unsettling. Nonverbal communication through flesh-to-flesh -flesh contact with another animal foregrounds our own corporeality and reveals our animality. Despite the sh lack of shared systems of meaning, animals and humans nevertheless find ways to communicate with one another. Anyone who lives with a companion animal, cat or a dog, or frequently interacts with an animal knows this to be true. Humans use many of the same mental and emotional operations in reading an animal's disposition as we do for humans. And since it's far less likely that an animal is trying to deceive us, you, you might say that an animal's nonverbal uh, emotional responses are easier to read. Attending to and deciphering animals' nonverbal communication is crucial to developing a normative ethical response towards animals. And uh, this is one of the goals of a feminist care ethics as a philosophical theory. Advocates of feminist care ethics maintain that compassion and empathy can and should inform our moral obligations to non-human animals, and that we should make a central place for our experiences of love, friendship, trust, and a variety of other affective responses as the basis for an ethic of care. As with feminism, care theory resists hierarchical dualisms, which establish the binary structures of dominant and subordinate. And like ecofeminism, takes as a point of departure the claim that women have a distinctively morally, uh, distinctive and morally significant relationship to non-humans because of their shared histories of oppression. As Josephine Donovan explains, quote, no longer must our relationship with animals be that of the conquest of an alien object, but the conversation between two subjects. We must recognize that the other has a nature of her own and it needs to be respected and with which one must enter into a conversation. It's important to point out that the care expressed by touch in these works is not unidirectional. Frida and her animals are engaged in a symbiotic of care and co-making. Frida cared for her animals as if they were her children, but the animals also cared for her. 
They help her work through the trauma of the trolley accident and her inability to bear children. And in her paintings, they comfort her through touch. So here in Self-Portrait with Monkey from 1938 and all of the other examples I provided earlier, you can kind of see how those long, slender, almost human fingers of her monkey companions reach out and console her through this sort of flesh-to-flesh -flesh contact. Um, and even in this photograph here on the, on the right, we see one of the monkeys. I'm not sure if that's um, Changuito or not, uh, sort of either grooms her hair or, or plays with her hair. In the case of self-portrait with the thorn necklace, her simian companion um, examines and investigates the source of her visible trauma, right? This sort of thorned cord that's piercing her flesh, wrapping around her neck. The young spider monkey appears to um, maybe be pulling the thorns out or trying to find a way to get the cord um, off of her neck, right? So expressing this type of attentive care that uh, really has the same core principles of, of feminist care ethics. Um, the embodied femininity of touch and care are perhaps best seen, however, in the love embrace of the universe. The Earth, Myself, Diego, and Senor Xolotl from 1949. In the work, the anthropomorphic yet ethereal embodiment of the universe embraces a feminine manifestation of the lactating Mother Earth, here, sort of symbolized as Mexico for Frida, um, who in turn caresses Frida, cradling an infantilized Diego on her lap. The universe also cradles Senior Xolot, who is sleeping comfortably at Frida's feet. So you can kind of see the way in which touch here functions um, as an allegory of care. In cases where physical touch is not present, Frida often substitutes flesh-to-flesh -flesh contact with a ribbon or a thread. Not quite the ribbon around Breton's bomb as, the, uh, as he once described uh, Callow's work, these delicate lengths of fabric extend the artist's touch to embrace multiple subjects, both physical and symbolic, within the work. And so here in Self-Portrait with Changuito, you can see that golden ribbon as it kind of weaves its way around all of the subjects, connecting them back, uh, connecting them back to Frida. And it's really interesting for me to think about the way in which that ribbon is a kind of a line and the way that lines function within Frida's work. Um, sometimes it's a line or a ribbon or an artery or a thread or an umbilical cord, right? Each has a rhetorical purpose within the pictorial space. They nurture and feed and connect the artist to all of her sources of pleasure and pain, of pride and grief and care and memory. Seen here in Henry Ford Hospital, the arteries from Frida's body become these red, sort of supple red uh, th lengths of thread that are tied to each of these individual items in, within, the, within the scene. And thinking about like line and connection, it's, it's interesting and conspicuously absent that Frida never included the heavy chains and leashes that we often see around the necks of her monkeys in photographs. The chains stand in stark contrast to the supple ribbon or the fleshy tissue and serve to constrain rather than caress. Uh, of course, they're meant to corral these incorrigible and, and energetic primates, but it's clear that the, the sort of brutal materiality of the metal did not fit within Frida's carefully constructed ethics within the painted image, where the bodily and the motherly sort of stand in as allegories of care. And so in this self-portrait with Monkey, uh, and, in, and this portrait from 1946, you can see the way in which that chain is almost like being replaced by this 
um, less uh, aggressive fabric ribbing. Third, species. To finish, I'd like to return to Marx's concept of Gottenswesen or species being, which he described in the estranged labor portion of his economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844. Frida's revolutionary Marxist politics have been covered at length elsewhere, but in discussing Marx here, I think it's just important to note that she really held uh, Marxism um, as an ideology with deep conviction. Reflected in 1954's Marxism will give health to the ill, Frida depicts herself being taken in by the open hands of a godlike Marx whose likeness hangs in the upper right. She exchanges her crutches for a book, almost certainly a copy of Das Kapital, indicating the healing potential of Marxism for herself, but also for the society and the planet. And again, there's the sort of symbolic hands, right? The symbolic touch that we talked about in that last section. Note the eagle as well uh, in, the, in the upper right. This is not the sacred golden eagle of the Aztecs. This is the evil capitalist bald eagle. Uh, with the Uncle Sam head uh, sort of being forcefully strangled here. Um, when Marx used the term Gottensphasen, he was describing a uniquely human ability to consciously shape the world around us for the betterment of our species. This is an action carried out by our social labor, which is the essence of our species. To be human is to participate in human worlding, Echoing Heidegger's later claims that humans are world-forming, whereas animals are poor in world, Marx sees humans as uniquely situated within the realm of Gottensphasen. While we now know that humans are not unique in the structure, as many other species participate in organized social labor, Marx's point was that our labor is an integral part of our species' identity. In short, what we do is who we are. The failure or inability to participate in the project of human worlding leads to alienation and dehumanization. This is one prong of Marx's critique of capitalism, that estranged labor or labor alienated from its products, thus, quote, changed for humans the life of the species into the means of an individual life. He continues, quote, in the abstraction which separates them from the sphere of all other human activity and turns them into sole and ultimate ends, they are animal. So the one thing that sets us apart from animals, the sort of social labor, is taken away from us by capitalism. Capitalism sort of separates us from the products of our labor. And as a result of that, Marx claimed that we become animal once again. While it is certainly true that humans are species beings, we have no evidence that we are alone in our self-conception as such. Other animals are likely plainly aware of their species membership. I mean, have you ever seen a dog see another dog? Right? They are, they're aware of their species membership, and in some cases even use their labor to produce, to make products for the collective good. Certainly ants, bees, dolphins, some fish and bird species come to mind. Marx's concepts regarding humans as the only species beings follows from his humanism, right, from his sort of background and training in humanism, and is certainly bound by the nascency of the biological sciences at the time he was writing. Although Marx viewed the human species as superior to other animal life, he argued that capitalism also alienated us from nature, which allowed us to see ourselves as something separate and other. We are the human subjects, and the non-human world is full of objects to be appropriated and profited from. Humanity loses something when it relates to nature in this abstract way, whereas in reality nature is a part of us, not something separate. Marx states, man lives on nature, and this means that nature is his body with which he must remain in continuous interchange if he is not to die. So he, he recognizes that we are part of nature. And I love this um, statement that nature is our body.
In being estranged from nature, humanity is also estranged from itself, from its animality, and from its body of nature. We're isolated as individuals rather than as part of a species, and apart from the infinitely sensuous material world to which we belong. Throughout all of his discussion, there is a sense in the economic and philosophic manuscripts that what is human and what is animal are not exclusive in their being. They are not two distinct essences, not binary. They instead overlap, slip, and flow into one another. In any given moment, we are some part human and some part animal. Remember his claim that what is animal becomes human and what is human becomes animal. Frida provides an illustration in her 1946 The Little Deer. Here she portrays herself as part human and part animal. Using the body of her beloved Graniso as a model, she explores her visceral trauma as experienced through the flesh of her animal body. Each trauma is depicted in the form of a penetrating arrow buried deep within the hide. While the deer was a feminine essence in ancient Mexico, as we discussed, Frida is embodied here as the stag. In many ways, Frida's own fluid identities are reflected here, an unapologetic, past-present, non-binary, pansexual, interspecies embodiment of the artist's self. While in her animal portraits, these identities are portrayed as distinct entities bound together by their significant otherness, the little deer collapses these into a single creature whose whole being is the living flesh. When thinking through this talk and putting the slides together, and in particular looking at the little deer, um, I couldn't help but recall a Kalima dog that I encountered at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art a few years back. This one shares the characteristic body type and pale orange buff of the others, but it is distinctive in that it wears an anthropomorphic mask. It's a little bit funny, too. Ancient peoples of Mexico saw a human-animal continuum that was not distinct and binary, but rather operated by degrees. Some humans were almost animal, and some animals were almost human. This is reflected in many ancient myths and stories about humans who can commune with animals or in, even in some cases physically transform into them to access that esoteric knowledge and spaces of the more than human world. Humans can impersonate and embody animals and animals humans. Frida and her work resists the estrangement which is necessary for the functioning of a modern capitalist society. As an artist, she maintains a direct connection to the products of her labor. Through her indigenismo and her connection to her native plants and animals, she is not alienated from nature. With her whole being, she envisions herself as part of a human, non-human continuum that existed for the indigenous forebears and that she saw reflected in the eyes and bodies of her animal companions. By thinking through and becoming other, Frida establishes a new type of species being, a non-binary essence that bridges the narrow abyss of human and non-human. Thank you.